Right, it is now 25 and a half minutes past the hour, live from Salford in Greater Manchester, your Richie Allen radio show on Fab Radio 2 here in the great city. We're on the TuneIn app, of course, as well, iTunes, Spotify and all of that nonsense. I can't wait to chat with Kevin, he's standing by just before we welcome him back to the programme. It's a real treat today. Um, UK unemployment is expected to more than double this summer after the number of people claiming unemployment benefits rose by 70% last month. Uh, The most since records began. Economists, former Bank of England governors, are telling us that millions of jobs are at risk, not just here, not just in Ireland, where Kevin is, but everywhere. As the current Chancellor Rishi Sunak said last week, that Britain faces a severe recession, the likes of which we haven't seen. It's dire. Where is the media? Well, we just had a good giggle at the broadcast media. But what about the print media? Where is it? Isn't it supposed to rigorously and vigorously hold to account those who made the decision to place the nation under house arrest and destroy the economy? Something which scientists uh, concede will cause far more death and misery in the long term than any virus at all. What about the implications for basic human rights and civil liberties? Is anybody asking these questions? My guest is a hugely accomplished author, journalist and broadcaster. He would be asking these questions if he was still writing for the national press. That's another story. Let's welcome back to the programme Kevin Myers. Kevin, I'm thrilled you're back on. How are you? Well, it's thrilled to be with you. I'm I'm enjoying the sunshine in in County Kildare in Ireland and sharing your uh, uh, shock and horror at the the global stupidity which is destroying the economic prospects for an entire generation. This has to be the greatest collective calamity in my lifetime to uh, assail the world. And it, you have already averted to the fact that the media are not doing their job. I'm never sure it's singular or plural, the word media. But there we are. The job is not being done. The questions are not being asked. What you've got is cowardice and conformism and this other element to informism, where people are informing on, on their neighbors. And this is kind of reminiscent of the days of any draconian uh, regime where you ring up somebody, you ring the authorities because of somebody you don't like doing something you disapprove of, and you get put on the, the blacklist. You can call it Gestapo, call it Stasi, call it Vichy France, but it's a, a comparable emotion. You, 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 you inform on people for doing things that are not doing any harm to anybody. I mean, just one small example. Every one of your listeners will know examples of their own, but a friend of mine um, was on, has a house on a lake in the center of Ireland. And he went fishing from his boat 100 yards offshore and a police patrol car, a a vessel came alongside him and told him to go ashore because he was violating the rules. We all know of stories like this. He was, I mean, talk about social distancing. He wasn't within 200 yards of anyone. He wasn't within a mile of anyone, but he was told to go back to his house. Now, I don't know who reported um, Dominic Cummings. I don't know who reported the paratroop colonel who's probably lost his job and who was um, having drinks with some fellow soldiers. But that's a very, very disagreeable sensation that people can phone or ring you, inform on you for doing things that are perfectly normal and natural. What we've done is, this is something that hasn't happened since an Aztec society used to sacrifice their young people to ensure that next year's crops are good. What we've done is, sacrifice the educational prospects of every single child and every single undergraduate in, in, in these islands and, and in Europe to save the health of people of my age. And that is simply wicked. It is completely wicked. And the most extraordinary thing is how the media have aligned themselves with this extraordinarily a dangerous and destructive project because no good can come of it. Yet the, the, the media that lies, for example, the Irish Times, two weeks ago had a special supplement on the, the deaths that have been caused by the coronavirus, and one was a sporting hero who had died. Well, he had been a sporting hero in the 1950s. Now, this is just stupid. One of the the dead of the coronavirus that we were all meant to mourn is a man who was aged 100. And meanwhile, 17, 18-year-olds are not doing their 
their A-levels or their, their leaving certificate or any of the final results on universities all over these islands and all over Europe are not processing students. And the information is already coming through from Norway and Iceland that we've got it wrong, that things were not as bad as, as were being projected, and that, in fact, that the, the, the shutdown is doing far more damage, as you introduced and as you said in your introduction, is doing more, far more damage than the virus could ever do. Before we come back to how people have become snitches and snoops, which is hugely important, before we come back to that, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about plenty of things. You say it's a wicked thing to do, protecting people of, of your age. They would say, I would imagine, we get accused, they would say, I'm talking about government departments, they would say we get accused of ageism all the time, we get accused of abandoning the elderly. Here what we've tried to do is to do all that we could to protect the most vulnerable, those who are most likely to become ill from it, and now we're getting hammered for it. They would say well, the lockdown... Yeah, yeah, that's the kind of thing that would come up. This, yeah. is, this is the governor's state at its most demented and deranged. Old people, and that includes me, have to look after our own health. We have to be held responsible and accountable for whatever happens to us, and we should obviously take precautions. But we know from Iceland and we know from other places that the, the, the conductivity of the disease amongst young people is almost non-existent. In Iceland, it appears to be completely non-existent, that a large number of children contracted the virus and ha exhibited no symptoms, whatever, and there was zero transmission from children to adults in, uh, in Iceland. Yeah. So, okay, so what do you do? Do you take the risk of, of uh, shortening the lives of people of my age and older? Yes, absolutely you do. You do not throw on the funeral pyre the, 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 the future of young people, but they are already stressed as it is. It's bad enough being 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. We've all been through those, those days, and they're terrible days. To, to add this extra burden, is quite insupportable. And one of the most extraordinary things, and I actually can't speak here for the events in, in Britain, but in Ireland, the teachers' unions have essentially said that, no, we, we will not arrange the um, exams to take place in the, the, that, where the summer holidays will be because they're insisting on r retaining their summer holidays. And the, what we've done is, is we've put the entire population into a kind of permanent freeze of, of the welfare state and destroying the basic economy underneath the welfare state. So people have expectations and people are going to have money from the welfare state that are entirely unsupportable. It will not be possible for Western societies to pay back the debts that are being incurred to protect people in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Now, we all know how insane this is. But the worst thing is, even if I am mistaken, is that voices like mine are not being heard at all in the Irish media. And in, in, in Britain, it's just Peter Hitchens, Lionel Schreiber, and Douglas Murray yeah. are raising the voices of dissent. Now, all of us might be wrong on this, but the only way to be proved wrong is to have an open debate in which there is an exchange of information without the sneering and the bullying and the cajoling and the name-calling, which now is a standard feature of any debate in, 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 in life anywhere, in, 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 not just in, in Europe, but in the United States of America and everywhere. The first thing you do is reduce somebody to a caricature and then destroy the caricature. And it's impossible for any state policy to be created in those circumstances. It's bad enough that voices like yourself, like yours, have been marginalised, save for the one or two that you mentioned. But what's even worse again, if I can say this, and I, I have worked at every level of the media, local, national, independent, you've got something even more sinister going on because scientific voices equally as credible as the ones who demanded the lockdown are being kept off the airways. I'm thinking of guys like Carl Heenahan or Hennigan, as they call him here, at Oxford University, a very senior, um, you know, evidentiary-based medicinal professor. I've, I've said that all wrong. Great guy. Uh, he's saying the lockdown is crazy. Shouldn't have happened to begin with, but they're keeping them off the air, Kevin. Yeah, you know, of course they are. I mean, the whole thing about the global warming was that you only heard one side of the argument. Yeah. You, you, a 14-year-old Swede who knows nothing about the environment, nothing about science, was elevated into sainthood. Yeah. This is simple organizational madness. She addressed the United Nations. 
as if she had anything to say to the world. She's a 14-year-old Swede. She knows nothing about the world. She knows nothing about the atmosphere. She knows nothing about the weather. She knows nothing about meteorology. She knows nothing about the climate. She knows nothing whatever. Yet she was elevated like the, 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 the saints of uh, Fatima and Lourdes in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. When you elevate a teenage girl into a position of sanctity, you know something seriously is going wrong. And Fatima and Lourdes and the Swedish girl who's Greta Greta Thunberg, this is all a comparable phenomenon where you elevate a virgin and take her word as being more important than the words of uh, serious scientists. Now, it's not surprising, looking at in retrospect, that we have committed economic suicide in Western Europe if we were so gullible as to elevate this, this girl of last year into a position of sanctity, where her, her word was more important than any of the scientists of the, of the kind you're talking about with whom she contradicted. She was able to silence people merely because she was uh, surrounded by the aura of, of sanctity. Now, if you don't discuss major issues seriously, then you are going to drive yourself into calamity. And this is what's happening. And I I haven't heard any economic explanation of how we're going to get out of this. Why Why are soldiers not being allowed to drink together if they are as soldiers meant to train together and and police forces not training together and cooperating together the fact is organizations and states survive because people cooperate with one another they have to take precautions to ensure that their health is is being protected but you don't destroy careers and you don't have the kind of nonsense and hysteria that we've seen over the recent weeks in, in Britain for such trivial causes now there is a Scottish minister uh, health minister Catherine Calderwood uh, who was twice warned about going to her holiday home, and she's a foolish woman. She went, you know, she had been warned and she ignored the warning. But um, I think perhaps she was looking for trouble. For the most part, people are obeying the law uh, because they're, they're scared of, of, of breaking from the consensus. Now, I haven't followed Dominic Cummings' thing uh, very closely. It's caused enormous joy in, in Ireland because. Ireland's going through an intensely disagreeable period of Anglophobia, and this just seems to me, to them, many Irish people, evidence of hypocrisy. I've read the Cummings affair. I think he was doing what, what any father would have done in the circumstances. And if he don't, wasn't breaking a law, he was breaking guidance. Now, there's a difference between guidance and a law. There is, there is, there is. If guidance becomes law, then we no longer have democracy. There is, but here's something very interesting about that. I'm, I'm, like yourself, I'm pretty agnostic about Cummings and what Cummings did. But, but, but what I find really interesting is I'd love to be, I'd love to have studied anthropology because I would have thought that a large body of people in this country, upon learning that Cummings had allegedly flouted the guidelines, that they might shift towards thinking what the hell are we locked down for at all? But they don't, because that's a, a, a more rational question, a more reasonable discussion to have. But they pile in on Cummings and on the government and at the same time demand more lockdown, Kevin. What's happening to people? What's happening to common sense and, and reason and rationality? Well, you know, I'm the wrong person to ask here because your listeners will be aware that I was um, silenced no platform yeah. by a series of lies three years ago, and I've hardly had a voice in the public domain in Ireland, and certainly not in Britain anymore, um, because of the the, the lies that were told about me, that I was an anti-Semite, a Holocaust denier, and a misogynist. All these are specific lies. The Jewish community of Ireland denounced the lies. They said, far from being a Holocaust denier, I had told the Irish people more truths about the Holocaust than any other journalist in Irish history. Now, so I was turned into the very opposite of what I am. I am a, 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 have been a long time, as you know, Richie, yeah, a publicist yeah. for the Irish who served in the Second World War to oppose Hitler. And yet I was turned within the, the British media and the Irish media into a Holocaust. And I it cost RTE radio and television 200,000 euros. That's what they settled up for on that's me, right. for, telling, for them telling lies about me. So that's the, the kind of thing that can happen. That you, when the, the mob lights on you, they will tell lies and they'll get away with lies. Because if you look on the Internet, you will, you will see the lies about me survive. But, and the truth, uh, the truth remains invisible. And this is happening day and daily. 
So it's have we... for the last four or five years, aided by that so-called social media. Now I'm not on the social media scene at all, in any guise, any representation. I'm just not there, and I'm really glad not to be there. Well, you're not missing anything there. I'm astonished how the mainstream media succumb to the filth and the ruin and the lies of the, of the mainstream, of, 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 the, of the social media. Because there is no way you can filter truth from fiction in that world. And fiction becomes fact, and facts then become an enduring uh, dogma in, in the public discourse. Now, uh, this is, so you can say that what we're going through now was almost historically inevitable. The, the, the closing down of public uh, debate, the closing down of alternative or uh, dissident opinions has been a systematic process over the last 10 years. And it has been incredibly uh, successful. And I, I, I cannot help wondering uh, of the role, of the concerted role of uh, California um, technology bosses in, in who run these social media organizations. I cannot help but wondering if, if this is not part of a vast project, not a conspiracy, but a project to make us all think like them, to use their words and to have their concepts and to ter use terms like multiculturalism and diversity and so on and so forth, till no one knows who they are anymore. It's almost impossible to say, I am in, in Britain, I am an Englishman and proud of it, without being called a racist by somebody or other. You can call yourself a Scot and be proud of it, Welsh and be proud of it, Irish and be proud of it. The moment says, I'm an Englishman, I'm proud of it, the Guardian will call you a racist. So you, 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 we, are, we have entered this kind of dead end where nothing but toxicity and filth and, and ruin awaits any, or anyone who attempts to have a serious grown-up conversation about the crises that face us. You know, you know, I wouldn't be reticent at all to use the term conspiracy. It's, it's, a, it's a registered historic fact that the Central Intelligence Agency introduced the term conspiracy theory and theorist to basically defame anybody who was asking any intelligent questions about the murder of Kennedy. And if one or two or three groups of people get together to effect some sort of change, you know, vis-a-vis -vis social media companies, maybe it is a conspiracy theory. A very good mutual friend of ours is asking, listening to this uh, this evening, what do you think is behind it all, Re even, even with the lockdown? I mean, it's amazing, she says, how in lockstep the world became so suddenly. Like they, if there is such a thing as they already knew what to expect. And before you answer that, Kevin, before you answer that, I was, uh, my, my listeners will be bored of me mentioning this. I was st stunned to see an Irish lawyer on Sky News a few weeks ago called Fanula Ni Aelon. She's from the West. She works for the United Nations now. And she said she had great suspicion at how, upon hearing that the coronavirus was, was, was a serious uh, public health uh, catastrophe, how very quickly, she said, societies and uh, governments and nations around the world very quickly produced reams and reams of documents with new rules and regulations. She said it's almost as if they were in a drawer waiting to be used at some time or another in the future. What do you think? Well, if that was the case, then they would have some proper arrangement for educating the children, protecting the children, the economic future of their states. I mean, I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong, or yeah. Fanula or Fidelma. I'm not saying, what I'm saying is that the evidence to me seems a little bit incomplete. Right. If there was going to be a, a, a blueprint for coping with this, then there would be a blueprint for coping with exams, because the one thing no society wants is uh, suddenly to find in two or three or four or five years' time that they haven't got doctors or, or haven't got teachers or haven't got scientists or haven't got technicians. So, so that, that's not the kind of evidence that I find compelling. No. I'm not saying that she's wrong. I just I'm un unconvinced by that sort of evidence. Can I just jump in there because I misrepresented well, it? Let me... The World Health Organization's role in this is deeply sinister. Yeah. And Trump was entirely right to withdraw... Um, American funding from it for the, temp for the time being. I mean, Tedros um, Ghebreyesus, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, yeah, yeah. The, the head of the World Health Organization, gave China a, a, a free, a clean bill of health. And we know that, Ch that this is a Chinese disease. It emanated from China, Wuhan province. We know this. It either came from an, a, 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 a scientific laboratory where they were making some kind of uh, nerve, a germ weapon or nerve weapon or whatever, or it came from the food market. You can take your choice, but it came from Wuhan province. When, when Trump stated this obvious 
truth that it was a Chinese virus. It wasn't an Irish virus. It wasn't a Manchester virus. It wasn't a Newcastle virus. It wasn't a Swedish virus. It wasn't a Norwegian virus. It was a Chinese virus. He was booed and heckled by the press corps. I mean, or almost to a man or woman, toadies of political correctness, for, for being a racist. It's a Chinese virus. Chinese restaurants are called Chinese restaurants because they're Chinese restaurants. And Irish pubs are called Irish pubs because they're Irish pubs, and so on and so forth. So you, you, there is a, a kind of barrier, a, a, a protection against the truth here. Unlike anything that has occurred in, in our lifetimes in a democratic society, the only comparison you can make in my lifetime is with the communist states of Eastern Europe and, and the Far East. Now, they're all gone, but China's not gone. They've transformed their economy into a capitalist economy, but the culture of Marxism remains in the apparatus of the state. And that culture seems to have left the Pacific Ocean and taken root in America. And that's the most extraordinary thing. The undoing of American individualism and its replacement by a general mob, not the kind of mob that we're all acquainted with in the past, the Salem, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, here, yeah. Salem stuff. But we're talking about an entire generation of young Americans, almost an entire generation, seems to have bought the Chinese idea that we must all obey the, the big brother. We must listen to what big brother says and, and, and anyone who departs from Big Brother consensus is an evil and wicked person who should be denounced. Let me the reason just, why um, Trump won four years ago was there were enough Americans to, be deplore, to, to deplore what was going on in the country they love. And Americans are very patriotic people, and patriotism is a noble virtue. It's an excellent virtue. And the people of Britain have every reason to commemorate this, this summer for, for, for good reasons, for the, the patriotism and, and, and devotion to the cause of freedom that was shown by the P British people in, in 1940. But patriotism everywhere in the Western world has become um, unacceptable. It's become a, a, a kind of toxic identity when, in fact, it's a noble one. It's an uplifting one. It's a selfless one. It means you do things for other people. And that kind of virtue has been replaced by an, a new virtue. So the, the most extraordinary project that I could uh, identify in this travesty in the last three or four months is something called protecting the NHS. Yeah, 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 yeah. As if the NHS was a god. The NHS was the end. The NHS was the great virtue, the great piety. It is not the NHS is a means to an end, and the end is the wealth and, and health of the people of Britain. And if the NHS can't do that, then something else is going to have to do it. But protecting the NHS in itself is a, is a, a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron. I want, to, I want to go back to two or three things you said there, just to, to put a couple of points to you. Um, let me do that before you come back in, because I know you've got loads to say. On the Wuhan thing, there is circumstantial evidence, I've seen it, that Trump's um, closest medical advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, was involved in a financial way with medical research into bioweapons in Wuhan itself. Now, that evidence is out there. Right? I, I'm no conspiracy theorist either, but I want to make that point. The second thing I want to say to you is, I mischaracterise what the Irish lawyer said. That's my fault. She wasn't suggesting that the virus, this was a, you know, a big kind of a made-up thing to take people's civil liberties away. What she was actually saying, it's my fault, mea culpa. She was saying, Kevin, that it's been, she believes that it's the long-desired position of Western governments, even if it's not the stated desire, that they do get to introduce things like lockdown and tracking people digitally through their phones and all of these things that we could spend hours talking about tonight. She said they would like to be more like these drastic uh, draconian places you mentioned earlier on, these former communist states. And she said maybe that, you know, they might have been waiting for the opportunity um, to introduce these measures. Hence the, you know, the, the, the documentation was in a drawer gathering dust for years and years and years. I don't think that's, I'm not saying it's true, but I don't think it's highly unlikely either. I don't think you're wrong in this regard. Yeah. But the, the instinct to govern is not something in most of us. Most of us would shun the idea, yeah. and we run from the idea of responsibility of government, making decisions over other people's lives. It's a rather unhealthy ambition to have. Yeah. I haven't got it, you haven't got it. No. I don't mind talking to people, I don't want to govern anyone's life. I don't want anyone to, to, have, you know, to have their life altered by some edict I've issued. 
But the political classes are different from that. They do actually want to alter people's lives. Now, they're never going to say to themselves, never mind to their electorate, I want to control you. I want to limit the number of you know, outlets or number of opinions you can have. I, I want to shape your mind so that mind then follows my mind. They're never going to say that to themselves, never mind to the, the ordinary people. But that's the instinct that's inside them. So when they see the opportunity to get a compliant subject and consensually driven population beneath them, well, that's, that's, that's what they're in politics for. They like controlling people. That gives them pleasure. It gives them a sense of satisfaction. It gives them a sense of self-worth. Most of us get our sense of self-worth worth from within our own selves. But, you know, it is an existential thing that we, we are gratified by you know, the simple pleasures of life, the jobs we do, the love we feel, the sex we enjoy, and all these things. That's not good enough for the political classes. It's quite clear that they love the idea of authority. And if they discover a means of authority that can really get people obeying them, but without any of the apparatus, the visible apparatus of control uh, or coercion, then so much the better, because they can say, look, you're behaving like free people, free men and women. I am not issuing orders. You are complying with the general wishes of the, the, your government, and that's actually rather splendid. And it, it's, I must confess that the English people and the Scottish people and the Irish people have defied all my expectations of them. I never thought for one second that so many people in, in these islands would be so compliant, yeah. so obedient, so submissive, and so cowed as they have shown themselves to be. There's so little dissent. It's terrifying. I mean, look, if the Stasi were to set up in England today, or in Ireland, or Wales, or Scotland, oh, I don't doubt for one second they couldn't cope with the incoming phone calls about somebody's neighbours. I'm quite sure that would be a norm. I know that the, the, the Germans in 1942, when they took over southern, Fra southern France, and not just extended their control to the, the, what had been Vichy control, they couldn't cope with the numbers of um, complaints by the informers, whatever. Uh, that the, the so and so was a traitor to the, to, to the Third Reich. They couldn't cope. There were too many too many uh, complaints. And I, I suspect that's the, that's the, the case here. That the, the 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 degree of unpleasantness in these islands now is without precedent in in my in my experience. I just read the media. I mean, it's horrible reading British newspapers now, listening to the BBC. And the BBC is now the Pravda of British life. It it, it states untruths as truths. I mean, it will, it will present uh, uh, David Attenborough's opinions as God-given facts. David uh, Attenborough is a decent old fellow, uh, but he is not a meteorologist. He is not a weather expert. He, he's not a climatologist. Yeah, he, his opinions on that vie only second to Greta Thunberg. I mean, so why would you treat people who are not experts as experts? Because you've been submitted, or you you submitted to the new authority of political correctness, and it's almost like it's almost like we collectively, I suppose, as, as a species, we've forgotten what the media is supposed to be doing um, and how it should do it, and the how it should be doing it is fascinating. As somebody myself who has, on occasion, taught radio production through city and guilds and and places, and of course, the, the perfect example of that was. The other evening, the presenter, Emily Maitlis, um, breached BBC impartiality in massive style, opening Newsnight by criticising Dominic Cummings and making all sorts of unsubstantiated sub suggestions in her opening monologue about how the British people felt about it. She was out of order, regardless of what you might think of her as a presenter. She's a pretty decent presenter, as it happens, but she was out of order and she was wrong. But we're into commentary now, not journalism, Kevin. Um, well, that's right, and it's not. I, I don't know what the outcome of, of that affair. Well, and I know very little about it, but I do know the Church of England bishops have, have joined in against Cummings. Yeah. Cummings is not an agent of the the Comintern or the Bolshevik Revolution. He's a man who clearly not a very particularly pleasant one. But no one in political life is. No, I mean, you, you must get that there into your head. No one in political life is in politics because he or she wants to improve the ordinary lives, the lives of ordinary people, they, they're in it for themselves. That's, that's a basic tenet that has to be understood. But the, he has aroused an uh, animosity which is completely disproportionate to what he actually represents. What he actually represents is 
to a large degree, the opinions of the average man and woman in the street of England. He does, he's a Brexiteer. Yeah. He believes in Brexit, and actually so do I. And I look forward to the day when there'll be our exit, when Ireland leaves the EU, or the EU ceases to be what it attempts to be, a single unitary state, because that would be a disaster for all of Europe. But anyway, he speaks the ordinary voice of people of Hartlepool and the northeast of England and Cheshire and, and, and Manchester, not the voice of the metropolitan elite in London. That's why Emily Maitlis would have felt free to have a go at him, because all her friends in Notting Hill said, oh, he's a terrible man, you are free to say what you like about him, as those same self, self-same people were saying things about me three years ago. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. she would be in an echo chamber and not know that actually north of the Watford Gap, people think and talk quite separately. They've got a clear sense of what it is to be English, or Welsh, or Scottish, or whatever. But they have a clear sense of what it is to be English, and they're not ashamed of that Englishness, unlike people who live in Notting Hill. Now, within the BBC, because the BBC is based in London, most of it's based in London, but the, 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 their mentality is European. They've, they've created this confected identity which has no identity at all. It has no basis. It has no emotional uh, uh, or, or military aspect because you know, you know that no Europeans will die for Europe, but you do know Britons will die for Britain. But so you've got this strange London-based European kind of offshoot, and an offshoot of the, the, of the Brussels identity, speaking to itself. And they get everything wrong. They got the, the referendum wrong on, 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 on Brexit, and they got Trump wrong. They get everything wrong because they don't know what ordinary people think and, and feel. So Dominic Cummings was held up for a, a, an unparalleled abuse. You'd think he was a major war criminal. You'd think he was a man of unspeakable depravity. Well, he's obviously a very eccentric and not particularly pleasant man. But he speaks his mind. But to have the, the, the bishops of England lined up one after the other, uh, traducing him, accusing him of being a liar, not one, and that's a very serious accusation, not, yet, what, not one of them was able to prove where he had lied. Yeah. He might have been imprudent, he might have been foolish, maybe he should have resigned. But he was looking after his son. It's a very plausible, and there was no one else to do it for him. It, you know, there the, 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 the were extenuating circumstances, and he didn't break the law. He broke guidelines. Is and we are all in a, a pitiful condition indeed if guidelines become mandatory because they're, they're not guidelines anymore, they're laws. Yeah, and they want to introduce a digital health passport for everybody to have. This isn't a conspiracy theory. They've admitted as much, and the companies are making them in Manchester. Basically, on our phones would be our digital health passport with all of our information on it. But even worse those phones would then become payment methods. You've seen this yourself, Kevin. I'm sure you've seen it. People actually no, tap... No, I haven't. Well, people tap... No, I haven't got a mo- I've got a mobile phone... But not one of the... A technology 20 years old. All it does is make telephone calls. You've got I can't no- get... It's not social media. We'd never dream of going anywhere so- near social media. I've got a telephone that my wife can ring me on. Very few people do ring me. But my wife can ring me to, uh, to tell me to get the bacon. And it, do- just <laughs> get the, the and it, and it doesn't That's do much it. else. Well, well, today's phones can be used in the same way that uh, credit cards or debit cards can be used. You can, touch, you can touch them. Yours can't, obviously. But most people's can. You can touch them to a contact point at a supermarket and you pay. Yes. It's completely stupid. It's crazy. Right it's now, here, 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 here's the point. The point is, these digital passports, they will contain every bit of information about you that is possible to contain, but they will also track your movements and your purchases. Wait for this. I'm not making this up. They will, all con- they will also, your digital uh, health passport, will contain your lifestyle choices on it, how much exercise you take, whether you smoke, whether you drink, and this will all be used to determine when you can go and when you can't go to certain places, outdoor events, theatre shows, concerts or whatever. I know you think your your leg's being pulled, but it isn't. It's an absolute fact. No, I'm this afraid is... I, 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 I know you're right. Yes, where we're I going. I know you're yeah. right because the yeah. Chinese have once again have yeah. it. Why are we not confronting the Chinese? Why, why is the Western world so craven before this monstrous state? Not the Chinese people, because the Chinese people don't have any say over the, the state. No. But they, they, they are creating the perfect control society. They are creating 1984. They are creating Big Brother. I hope he's not lost, Kevin. He's instead of that being an object of, of, of terror and, and of, of military preparation, because it's quite clear that Chinese have ambitions on, 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 on South America, they're 
massively penetrated the Chilean economy and, and both flanks of Africa. They, they control vast amounts of territory in Africa, and they control the, 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 what you, they've got the, the, the extraordinary position that you trade with the Chinese, you buy them things from the Chinese, but Chinese don't buy things from you. At the bottom of it, Richie, I think this is a kind of great revenge for the, the Opium Wars. Now, the Opium Wars were a really scandalous affair, but um, the, you know, where the, the British fought the, the Chinese in order to, so that they, they could um, export opium into the, the Chinese market, and the, uh, and the Chinese lost. Well, now, we, it's a long time to, carry, to bear a grudge, but the fact is the Chinese are behaving in a way that you would never allow any neighbor to behave. You don't allow any neighbor to have two rules. You don't allow him to have late night parties, and then, but he complains when you've got late night parties. When, the, when David Cameron met uh, the Dalai Lama in 2011, I think it was, the Chinese almost broke diplomatic relations with Britain because of this. That's right, yeah, I remember, yeah. Uh, which is quite shocking. And in, in the preliminary meetings before David Cameron announced that he was going to put, put for the rest of his life really large measure of social distancing between him and, and the Dalai Lama, British officials were brought before the Chinese Foreign Office and were made not merely to write an apology, but to stand up and announce it, to read it in public. Not in public, but before the Chinese officials. And the Chinese official, head official said, yes, we wanted to hear you say that. Kevin, I'm, the I'm, Chinese state does not respect people that submit to it. No, I'm going it to give you. I'm going to give you the fi- respect people that stand up to it. I'm going to it g- is not in the way of any dictatorship, any despotism. You to s- respect people that lie down in front of them. Let me give and you. Um, let, let me. I, I, I'm just going to say this, and I'm, I'm going to give you the final word. Uh, thanks for coming back on. By the way, it's been a real treat to have you on. Uh, I don't say that lightly, and I hope you'll come back again sooner rather than later. So I'm going to give you the final word. But what I would say to you is you described China, what you said about its designs on South America, Latin America, of course, uh, Africa. You are absolutely right. The system the Chinese people live under, despotism, you're absolutely right. But I I would say, and you'd expect me as a champagne socialist to say this, I would say, I will see what the Chinese are doing and I will raise you with the behaviour of France, the UK, the United States, Israel, Germany. I would point to Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, we could be here all day long, Kevin. You've got two ideologies in the West and in the East, but both of them want to impose their own centralised government on planet Earth. I would argue. Final word to you. Well, I don't think there's any evidence that the people of the United Kingdom want to impose their, the their way, their will on, on, on the people of the Earth. I don't think there's much evidence in the United States that want to do that. And the, 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 the evidence of, of Chinese penetration is techno, technological, technological and economic. That's quite, quite clearly before our eyes. I don't think the Russians, for example, want to control the world. But the, 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 the man in present Xi of, of, of China is not like anyone else. We, we, we don't have to compare with Hitler or Stalin. He's or Mao. He's in a different category. He does believe in the long-term term project. He believes in penetration and economic subversion. And what's, what's what we're seeing now? The, the um, American economy is essentially controlled by the dollar savings within the, within the, the, the Beijing government. They, they, they can control the world economy, and that's a project they've been working on for over 30 years. And they have the power to turn on and off the economy, economic wealth of, of, of the West and, and, and the entire world. Nobody else is doing that. I mean, Russia is accused of all sorts of uh, malfeasance, and he's a terrible man, Putin. But I don't believe he has a project to, to subvert the United States of America or, 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 or South America or even Europe. He doesn't want to bully Europe, but he doesn't want to control Europe totally. The Chinese project is quite different. I, I'm not able to understand it or explain it because it's outside my understanding. But it is something without precedent in, in, in world history that I know of, that a country can accumulate power and wealth like this and can release a disease like this. It's the third such disease has emanated from China this century. The third plague. And this is a, quite an extraordinary event, not merely extraordinary in itself as an, epidem- as a, 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 as a, a epidemic, but a, 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 the fact that so little comment has been made about this in, in the Western world, that the, the, the people who are receiving these gifts from China are staying silent as the gifts are showered on their head and bringing economic ruin and death to our peoples. I said you would have the last word. I'm a man of my word. I don't agree with that last point, but we can pick that up again in the future. Very quickly before you go, um, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, 
um, first began reading you when I got my first production job, my first radio job back in the mid-1990s. Um, I'm not going to blow smoke at you and tell you what an extraordinary writer you are. Um, I've done that before. Why don't you write again? Why don't you put together a website? I am convinced that conservative... I'm not saying you're conservative. I'm not painting you into a corner or putting you in a pigeonhole. But, um, you know, publications like Spiked Online, there are many of them that have writers, sadly, on the right. I say sadly because I'm a socialist. Um, I, I think people would fall over themselves to republish you. I really would love to see you do that, Kevin. You're an important voice. Well, thank you, Richie. We'll see what happens. All right, my friend. Thanks for Take giving care. us your time today. Go back to the sunshine. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Kevin. Left it. All the best, mate. Thanks yeah, for that. Bye. I love to have him on the programme. Kevin Myers, live from Dundalk uh, in Ireland. Great writer, great broadcaster. Um, used to bring him on uh, WLRFM back in my time as producer there. Uh, he presented Challenging Times for years in Ireland as well. Um, a national radio, of course, in television. And wrote for the, for the Times and the Sunday Times and lots of other newspapers as well. And as he mentioned earlier on, he was deplatformed for no good reason. Um, back in 2017. Kevin Myers live on the Richie Allen uh, radio show. The time is exactly six minutes past the hour. Tell you what I'll do. Give me a minute.